start with Trump on the stand. It was short on substance, short on decorum, and very, very short on truth, yet overflowing with theatrics and deflection and grievance. Donald Trump's eruptive testimony today in the $250 million civil fraud lawsuit in New York, though historic, felt familiar in some ways, except for one key difference, the arena. It was not a Fox News sit down or a meandering political speech, but Donald Trump sat down today in a courtroom and in courtrooms, facts and the rule of law still matter. In fact, they reign supreme. And in that domain today, Trump was repeatedly admonished by the very man who will determine the fate of his business empire and brand and the future of the size of his family's wealth. That man is Judge Ngoron. Time and time again, the judge has used his authority as a judge to interrupt Donald Trump's everyone's out to get me. This is politically motivated shtick ploy to run out the clock on testimony that was limited to a single day. That was today. As our NBC News team inside the courtroom noted, quote, the question was, and let me ask again, became familiar refrains as Trump sought to avoid providing actual answers. What he did do was try to crank up the chaos. He lashed out at the attorney general and Judge Ngoron, who raised his voice on more than one occasion and beseeched Trump's lawyers to control their client. In the end, today's testimony was hugely significant and historic, not just as it relates to the case at hand, but for what it portends. After all, Donald Trump is set to stand trial four more times in criminal cases next year, where juries will determine his fate. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is just the beginning. And it's where we start today with some of our most favorite reporters and friends. Here with me at the table, Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times investigations reporter Russ Butner is here. Also joining us, former top official at the Justice Department, MSNBC legal analyst, my official wingman, Andrew Weissman is here. Also joining us, former lead investigator for the January 6th Select Committee, Tim Hafey is back with us. I, I, I'm not even sure if this is an appropriate question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What did we learn today? What did we learn today? We learned that Donald Trump, I think we already knew what we learned today. <laughs> we learned that Donald Trump is not going to answer questions with facts. He's not going to actually yeah. address the issues that are on the table. We learned that he remains hostile and angry about this whole thing. We learned that he sort of separated himself from his sons, I think, and how they're addressing it. Their approach, which seems like it might have been coached by lawyers, is to say, we don't know anything. The lawyers over here, the accountants over here told us what to do. That doesn't really comport very well with the facts that have been presented in the case. But Donald Trump's defense is, I didn't do anything wrong. And I'm right. You're wrong. No matter what documents you have, what records you have, everything I have is worth far more than what you say it is. He went back to Mar-a-Lago and said it's not worth $18 million, as they said. Well, that's not what they said. That's the property assessment. Those never match value. What he said it was worth was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Today, it was said it was worth between $900 million and $1.8 billion. And the attorney general said it was worth about $75 million. So he's going to just throw up more smoke, right, and avoid the topic that's on the table and try to deflect it. And, uh, and, and hopefully, I, I don't actually know what the goal is in all that. Let me, let me, let me try to understand where that might trip him up legally, and, and then we'll deal with the perfect call defense, which is what this was. Um, isn't the alleged, or it's not even alleged, it, he's liable for financial, for financial fraud because in many instances, he did what you're describing, he inflated the values, but there are also instances where he reduced them to pay less on certain policies or where that was advantageous, right? He does play it both, both ways. ways. Yeah, I'm not sure that that all comes out in this case. He definitely does that for property tax assessments. He constantly undervalues properties and then creates something different when he's presenting it to the bank. Um, you can that can rise a level of fraud, but I think the the um, the pattern in this is the, case, the inflated assets inflation. is what he was pressed yeah, on today. Yeah. What is his? I mean, other than it was a perfect um, valuation. Is there any other substance to his testimony today that could cause problems for his kids? That's an interesting question, Nicole. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, his, the problem with his kids' testimony, I think, is it doesn't match with what happened, right? They said we relied on our accountant. They actually provided the information to the accountant. And when the accountant, Donald Bender, learned what they had done, that they had withheld information on appraisals, that they had withheld information about restrictions on how properties could be used 
he quit. Right? They, they, he quit that day. I think that's very strong evidence that that was a shock to that firm. And they stopped signing those statements of financial condition, and they notified people that they could no longer stand behind them. So I think his kid's testimony has its own sort of internal problems. And whether I, I don't understand what he's trying to say, how he's trying to say things work. He's trying to say, I'm an expert in real estate. I know everything about real estate, except for when it comes to valuations, I'd I, maybe I don't know anything about how that works. His kids were saying that. They do kind of conflict, but I'm not sure it's in a way that would rise to the level of a perjury charge or create other kind of conflicts going forward. But it doesn't create a very clean record if they're trying to make a presentation to an appellate court that the judge didn't decide this case based on the facts. And for your now years of sort of reporting on his finances and the, the fraud that occurs sort of the original sin, the, the frauds, the, the lies told about the inheritance and about making the money when he actually lost a lot of his father's money. How did today's testimony sort of either either stand out or, or, or present itself as on brand with your body of reporting? Yeah, I mean, that's the most frustrating part of Donald Trump. Is I think he actually believes what he says. He <laughs> presented this idea to the world that he that he didn't get money from his father. He got half a billion dollars right. from his father, that he didn't lose that money, that he built something greater. But if you look at every era of his life, from the 80s to the 90s to 2000s, he, he lost the money that he had there. And it wasn't from things that were difficult calls. It was from this kind of thing. It was unforced errors, where he's making poor judgments. He's even ignoring the advice of the people around him. He's ignoring the promises he's made to lenders and to his stockholders, right? And he runs things into the ground. And then just as he's kind of like laying with nowhere to go in the early 2000s, Mark Burnett shows up, a brilliant television producer, and makes him a star and funnels another half a billion dollars to him over the next decade there that allows him to create more money losing business. A facade and a, a facade, facade of success. Right. Um, Tim and, and Andrew, I, I want to ask you both questions first as people who investigated Trump enterprises. I mean, Tim Hafey, was there anything about how he presented on the stand that made you wish you'd had um, either a, a live or, or taped deposition with the President of the United States? Yeah, absolutely, Nicole. Look, when we, the Select Committee issued its subpoena, the conventional wisdom was that he would never come. But there was a fair number of folks on the other side who thought sort of the hubris would smoke him out or would, would have him take advantage of the opportunity, particularly given the level of attention that the committee was getting that sort of beckoned him to get attention. And our thought always was uh, let him talk, right? Ask a lot of questions based on what other witnesses have said about the election, about what happened on January 6th, and, and almost anything he said would be favorable. We obviously didn't get that opportunity. Um, so it, it, the only other thing that strikes me about today in looking ahead to the criminal cases or looking back to what we did is that there, I'm just not expecting at all any sort of acknowledgement of responsibility, right? Like we thought that there could be a scenario by which there would be potentially some willingness to admit a mistake that uh, didn't happen with us. It certainly didn't happen today. I don't expect that it, it is possible for the former president to admit any mistake. So I, I don't expect that there's going to be any resolution uh, at all if he continues to take that approach in the in the criminal cases. I mean, Tim, the, the parallel, though, I, I think in what he I mean, he didn't reveal much, but what he held to was that the valuations were perfect everything's bigger than it was. And what I kept thinking was, if, if you if you had a chance to ask him questions, the insurrection, therefore, would have been perfect. He only wished they'd gone farther, right? He only wished they pressured Pence into doing the right thing. I mean, he is an absolutist in what Russ described as his belief in his own, you know, Bill Barr's favorite word, BS. And so I think it's such a fascinating window into Trump as a witness to his own delusions. Yeah. Yeah. And well, the question, though, is, is it sincere belief or is it a sales pitch? Right. Like it's I don't know that he necessarily would say on the merits these properties are worth X or Y. Uh, he certainly is selling that they are in an attempt to get financial institutions to give him money. Right. It, it's very hard to separate sincere belief from what he thinks is in his business or 
or personal interest. Very similarly for Jack Smith, he's going to have to try to prove that there was an intent to disrupt the joint session. And getting inside someone's head is difficult. Uh, the combative nature of the testimony, the judge will have to evaluate credibility, just as a jury will in the criminal case, will will help decipher that. But I don't know that it uh, that it's. I get a sense that this is necessarily all sincere beliefs, or as much a, a spin or a pitch to make money.